Welcome to Chew On This. You are about to enter a discussion on how to actually live out faith in Christ in the reality of our messy lives. This discussion comes from our Wednesday night crew, the pastoral preaching notes, and the live large group discussion these notes prompted, something we like to call a community-based learning experience. Come on, chew on this with us. Change. Yep, change. How do we embrace change? Oh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's not use the word embrace. There are those who have a tendency, a small group, who say they enjoy change. They like the different, 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 different. But when it comes down to our core being, there are things that help us feel comfortable with life. They help us get through our everyday. What happens when those things are shaken, identities are shaken, and there is a systemic change? How do we respond to that? Thank you so much for joining us on this week's podcast. This is Pastor Orlean Hasseltine along with Pastor Robin Bjornson. And this week's discussion is on the topic of who is this man called Peter? We're on week five. We're looking still at this idea of Peter and leadership. We're looking at Peter as he steps into walking the church through systemic change. After this, then we get a chance to see Peter as Pastor Peter. But we're not quite there yet. So this discussion was had live here at our Forest Lane campus of Maranatha at on Wednesday, July 14th. And once again, we had a hard time leaving because we weren't done with the discussion. There's all of these questions that come up in the group, in our personal minds. Say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about this? How did that connect to this? And it's amazing. This is called a live <laughs> community-based learning experience because there's a lot of things that happen that we don't have privy any knowledge about that we just have to lean into our understanding of human nature and when it comes to this topic of change and how you guide it through there are books leadership books that we could fill a room with dealing with this one word and here we see the Holy Spirit is navigating this baby church to get the message of the Messiah outside of Israel. And how in the world is Peter used to do that? I want to let you know that all of the notes for today's discussion are on our website, realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday night. They are noted, so you can go and see the different resources that we use. But I just want to give a shout out to InterVarsity Press and their Bible Speaks Today series. Truly, truly enjoying just hearing an echo, hearing a direction, one of my favorite commentary series, just getting to know a little bit about, well, maybe it could be this. They don't go up and say it has to be this way. They, they let, let you just walk through and it's like, you know, some say this, some say that, so you can navigate through. And I love how that stimulates Pastor Robin, my brain, that it's okay if I do that, as long as I don't walk around saying I'm the Holy Spirit and I've decided it's this, because Scripture doesn't say it, it doesn't say it. The book of Revelation is probably the, the, the primer for this. It only says so much about end time theory, about eschatology, and the rest is all conjecture. And we have a tendency to embrace our conjecture and turn it into fact, and eh, that's not... That's not good. That's not good living. That's not good, good, good exegesis. That's just not good. So it's lovely picking up commentaries that do the same echo back as I am studying and reading. It's like, okay, this is good to know because I know just a microscopic piece. Love to study, but there's just so much to know. And it's lovely seeing those who are theologians who have spent, that is the focus of their career. They are not pastoring in a local church. And they study and they gather and they write. And it's great to be able to see that. And you hear the echo of, well, it could be, but don't forget about this. And so here we're going to be looking at a process. We know what happened in Scripture, but all the things that connect A to B to C, hmm, hmm, hmm. And I tell you what, we're going to get in the middle of a great big fight as we go through today's, <laughs> today's message. Because guess what? Change pokes at people, and it makes us behave a little strange. And... As long as you're a human being, this is part of our process. So getting the message of the Messiah outside of Israel. So here we're going to be taking a look at Peter as he navigates this blessing of leadership that Jesus gave him back in Matthew 16 when Jesus tells him, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in heaven. What a crazy definition of leadership. 
go, go do this. Make sure you live according to scripture or you're going to really screw up this verse, buddy. Make sure you live. It's like, I don't think I want that tattooed on my brain. I don't think I want that tattooed on my chest. It's like, oh, the, the, the keys. No, 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 no. You keep the keys. And when I ask you to come, you do the unlocking. So then I know it's of you, right? Exactly. And as we discussed in the last podcast, when we talked about uh, Peter standing up to abuse and dealing with Ananias and Sapphira, this idea of he just knew the Holy Spirit was there. There was some past experience. He'd been trained, and he did it in a group, and they just knew that this is evil. This evil cannot be allowed to grow in the church because it will kill it. And how the Holy Spirit, after they say, like, wait a minute, why are you doing this? You, and they stopped the evil, and boom, the Holy Spirit came and operated. It sounds horrible to say that, that the people died, but okay, so we're looking back in the lens of that time, and the Holy Spirit confirms, you're right, this is that same self-aggrandizement spirit that got Judas to where he was and tempted Peter, and Peter had a hard time with, but he made it through. And so all of this idea of navigating change and what it looks like. So here, Peter, this had to be echoing in his brain continually as he's stepping. And it's nice to know, especially at the beginning, that the group of 12, the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles, operated together, and they were together quite a bit until the dis- diaspora. Did I say that correctly? Diaspora. Yeah. Diaspora. There we go. Yeah, yeah. I forget the A. Yeah. The diaspora, until that happened after the stoning of Stephen. So they spent a good chunk of time getting their leadership feet in shoes that felt comfortable, if that can ever be said of leadership. Well, and that's the thing I think about too, Pastor O, because the only reference really that I have as a touchstone into some of what they might have been feeling is uh, being in a foreign country, you know, where um, people are people and they navigate through the day, but you're so disoriented because it isn't what you're used to. Correct. And so here's this group of people, and they have a whole lot of familiar around them, and yet it's still a very disorienting time where, huh, I'm not quite sure how to live here. And they're figuring that all out together. Yes, yes. And it's nice when all of them are a bit unsettled, Mm -hmm. but it's interesting. I'm not sure if that unsettling reveals I think it probably does. The unsettling does reveal the the fears in our heart, a little bit of our core being, because it's crazy some of the arguments that just won't go away and some of the learning curves where some refuse to change and learn. There is no change in their world. And yet Peter had to deal with it. It's interesting in John 4 when Jesus was still here in human form and he's talking to the apostles, he talks about that the... The harvest is plentiful. I mean, open your eyes and look at the fields for they're ready for harvest. That this concept of there's going to be a time for you to go and gather. There's going to be things growing. And I'm going to be asking you to go and to wherever you find yourself, you're either going to be planting or harvesting or fertilizing. You're going to be doing something and using this agrarian imagery because they were all very familiar with that. And what I'm going to ask you to do is be a laborer. Wherever you find yourself, go do this. So I have to ask myself, too, how much of that echoed as, oh, new new stuff, oh, here I am, you're going to want me to do what? Oh, okay, you want me to pray for that person to be healed? Okay, oh, you want me to go help build this thing? Okay, so this navigating of there wasn't this set, every time I show up, this is what I do. It just didn't work like that. Every time they showed up, they did what was ever needed to be done, whether it was physical labor or whether it was settling a dispute or whether it was calling somebody out who was trying to damage the church body. So, okay, here we go. I'm going to be doing this. I think as the church continued to grow, there was more help. And so then there, there was a definite little, there was a definite shift as we're going to find out when Peter steps into being Pastor Peter, which is revealed in First and Second Peter. So we'll get a chance to, to see how he preaches and how he teaches in the next podcast. So after the great diaspora, did I say it right, Pastor Robin? Mm-hmm. All yeah. right. So there we go. That in Acts chapter 8, here, this is after the diaspora, and we find that Philip ended up going down into Samaria. Now, it's important to note that there wasn't any lost love between the Jews and the Samaritans. 
they really didn't care for one another. The Jews looked down on the Samaritans because they were half Jewish and half Assyrian. And in their history and how that, that happened, they were looked at as quote unquote hybrid Jews. Like, uh, you're not like me and whatever. So they're not allowed, they're considered unclean. They can only be in certain places in the temple. And actually they set up their own worship system in their area. They worship at the mountain that Abraham went up to offer Isaac and they said that was the holy mountain. So, hey, you're gonna treat me like this when I'm gonna tell you my system's better than yours and blah, 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 blah. So they had some similar, some similar uh, religious customs and they believed in portions of the Pentateuch, but they were not the same. And the Samaritans got to the point where ours is better if you're gonna treat us like that. So there is no, to the point where individuals would actually take the time to walk around the city instead of walking through it. And there's some really interesting things ab about that discussion that we're not going to get into into this podcast. But here, this is the cultural and historical mindset. And here the diaspora is happening, and Philip ends up in Samaria. He, he goes there, and he's living there, and he starts to do what Jesus taught him to do. This idea, okay, this is what Jesus said. These people have needs. Let's go minister. Let's go tell these people about who the Messiah is. And it's interesting to note, I can't, I'm guessing somewhere, maybe eight years prior, maybe 10, somewhere in there, Jesus was in Samaria, and he ministered to this woman of quote unquote, not good standing, and she ended up going and getting the leaders of the town to come out, and, and I believe this guy is the Messiah. So I wonder when Philip showed up, what did he run into? Did he run into any God fearers? Did he run into any people who knew about the Messiah? Yeah, we remember him. What happened to him? I mean, those types of things. We heard about this. So he proclaimed Jesus to them, and I wonder how many of them remembered this incident of Jesus speaking truth into this woman's life and how she was basically the first missionary. So there had to be some type of subculture, a culture there that, oh, I remember. And so here comes Philip proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah and praying for people. And they heard and saw the signs he was performing. <laughs> for unclean spirits came cr out crying with a loud voice. Um, because many were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So big party, there's a big party, woo, this is the power of God, the power of God. They didn't have other, I mean, this was it. It's either this or things don't change. There wasn't any type of anything. So they, this was their resource to lean into, to have health in their, their life and with their people. And it was just crazy, to the point, it kept going and kept going and kept going that the church in Jerusalem, that was the navigating head for all these churches, heard about it. It's like, whoa, there's a big thing happening over in Samaria. And so guess who they dispatch? They send Peter and John. Peter and John, go check this out. Go see. Let's make it. They did. They make a decision. Go see what Philip is up to. So they go out there, and then they, they prayed for them so that the Samaritans might receive the Holy Spirit. And guess what? They did. They did, and, and Simon the sorcerer wanted to buy this power because he was freaked out by it, and man, I don't blame him, you know, but the, his motivation was the same as Ananias and Sapphira, not a good thing. So Peter and John are there, they lay their hands on them, and the people received the Holy Spirit. So we can call this the Samaritan Pentecost. All right, so this is amazing, this happened. So it happened, they see the same thing that happened to them in Acts chapter 2. So, okay. This must mean that Jesus, when he talked about the harvest is plentiful, and they had to rehearse everything he said, and so he must have meant, if you have any Jewish whatever in your history, because, I mean, this is their cultural mindset. This isn't a, a bad or a negative thing. This is how they made it through all of these years of not having a homeland and all of the atrocities they went through, and they defining their culture with, with their with their laws and their rules of worship and, and who they are and living according to them and honoring all that Moses established to define them and to, to make them a nation. So they did a marvelous and still do a marvelous job of embracing who they are culturally. And so now they're watching the Holy Spirit say, okay, when it comes to faith, when it comes to this, there is a, a fluidity. So maybe it includes those who have any kind of connection we're watching the Holy Spirit. Now, this is me just making stuff up, because in my imagination, I have to wonder what they're thinking. And it had to blow their minds to see the Holy Spirit just, well, it's the same thing that happened to us, but these people are not all, they're not Jewish. They're only sort of Jewish. How does that work? I'm not sure. This is not, remember, the big rule still is, 
you walk around Samaria. Because if you are contaminated by them, you can't go to the temple. You can't worship. You can't do this until you go through all this purification and all this stuff. And I tell you, people look at you like you're a lazy believer because you allowed yourself to be contaminated. This is a really, 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 really big thing to change. To change. So here, this is happening. Now, we talked about timeline. And I've looked, and I have to admit, I'm just tired. Trying to create a timeline of how all this stuff and how many years. And so just trying to guess that we're navigating where James the Apostle, John's brother James, is killed by Herod. I think James, it was about 10 years after Jesus was ascended, if I remember correctly. So we can use that kind of as a point. So this is, this hasn't happened yet. So it has to be within the first 10 years of the church growing. So they had the Samaritan Pentecost. Yay! And they go on doing what they do. I'm sure Peter and John went back to Jerusalem and did their leadership things there. And then, you know, for some odd reason, we're watching Peter, who observed and followed his cultural heritage. Because in Acts chapter 10, which we're heading to right now, Peter makes a declaration that he's never, he's never eaten anything common or ritually unclean. He follows that system. and But we find that he may have followed the dietary restrictions, but here he is staying in a home with Simon, a leather tanner, which is an unclean profession. So if you're around a leather tanner, even though he is of Jewish descent, that you would have to go through ritual purification in order to get into the temple and do all of that, which these things are definitely established because they keep the community healthy. Some of these are physical health things that were taught by the Lord to them to keep their just what we would call common sense, especially when you're dealing with blood. And, and they understood that. So this was considered an unclean job. And so if, so Simon is staying there, Simon Peter is staying there. So that makes you go, hmm, all right. So he's staying with Simon the leather tanner. And while he is there, he, re, he goes up, he, he tells them that, you know, here we find this in Acts chapter 9, verse 43, that Peter stayed many days in Joppa with Simon, a leather tanner. And that doesn't mean a whole lot until you start thinking about it. And it's interesting because what we're about to encounter and read here in Scripture, Luke repeats it, not once, not twice, but three different times this story shows up. This story is pivotal in change. This thing is so God-anointed and directed and God-crazy. I love when it's God-crazy. And it's strange. Every little facet that goes into it just sinking deeper into my brain, realizing, you know, there's a whole lot more. Because when you read Scripture, especially in my devotional time, I just try to stay and read the Word and not do any research on it. And if I have questions, I write them in my notebook and go look for answers later but just sitting in God's presence enjoying the actual word as it's written and just worshiping that way so interesting this one there's all of these I get a sentence down and I'm like huh how did that fit in so did Simon did um Simon the leather tanner and Simon Peter I mean did the leather tanner Simon have children and what was his house like and it appears his house was a little bit larger so maybe it was a really good place to receive guests and and it was in a in a place in a city where people could come and go so Peter used this house and people shared their homes they didn't have other bills so they used the house as a way to to meet and work do church work and or was it a place of where, where Peter would go to rest and spend time alone with the Lord so I don't know I was just wondering what kind of relationship him and the leather tanner had. So here we have Simon doing this, and it says um, that he is staying there, and let's make sure I haven't, this is what I did last night. Pause. Just let me pause here in the podcast. I haven't done this before. I just want to make sure. Okay, I did pause. So he is enjoying I'm not going to tell that part of the story. That was a pause for, what would you call it, excitement? A momentary pause to build excitement for the rest of the story. <laughs> yes, here we go. We don't want that piece of the story yet. Well, what we want to realize is while Simon Peter is staying with Simon the leather tanner, there's something else happening in Caesarea. So here, when we get into Acts chapter 10, there is this strange thing happening. There is this person who has no Jewish blood in them. They're Italian. 
They're a Roman. They're part of the occupying force. They are the enemy amongst them. They're the people they, that the Jews want out. They want to run their own country, and these guys are running it. And we'd really, really, really want you to leave. And here we find out in Acts chapter 10 that there's a man in Caesarea named Cornelius. And he's a centurion of what is called the Italian regiment or the Italian cohort. And it's interesting, you read that, it's like, thank you, Luke, for letting us know. So why is that important? Because everything that is written is important. So this individual, probably unmarried in order to have this position in the military, you could not have a family because they moved you around so much. And so he was the overseer. He was an officer in charge of 10 groups of 100. So he had 1,000 soldiers that he oversaw that were there working in the city and they would assign you a territory for about a year so if this is true of him he was there for about a year but it's interesting while he is in Caesarea while he's there he has this experience of encountering worshipers of Yahweh worshipers of God he encounters the Jewish people that he is supposed to be helping to control and he finds that their worship sparks something in him. Cornelius has become a God-fearer. He is participating in worshiping. He's going into the synagogue and praying into the Gentile section. And he is so well-respected and so well-loved that everyone respects this man. He's a very devout man. And once again, he is part of the occupying force. But his faith had hands. I mean, he did things. He believed and he operated as a godly man. And so he was participating in the time of prayer at 3 p.m. And this is called the Tamid. And he participated in this prayer. And this is the continual prayer, the perpetual burnt offering prayer that happens at 3 p.m. And we find this same concept of forever and continual. This is part of God's character we find in Psalm 25 and in Psalm 34 and in Isaiah 58. The words or the phrases, my eyes are ever toward the Lord. That type of continuum in Psalm 25 is the reason this prayer happens. This, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. In Psalm 34, same concept behind this time of prayer. And the Lord will guide you continually in Isaiah 58. That whole concept of continual, always going, always on, always moving. That is what this prayer time is. And so here we find that this Roman centurion named Cornelius participates in this. This is part of his normal everyday experience. So he's doing this proud and out loud in public in the community. People in his group were going with him and they were participating. I mean, he was a man who had people who followed him. He was a good leader. And so he's participating in this time of prayer. So while he's in this time of prayer, he has a vision. Cornelius is going to become unglued. He has a vision. An angel of God comes and has a conversation with him and says, Cornelius, at which time you, you know, have a, a mini attack and you can't breathe and oh no. So here this Roman individual in this time of prayer has this angel come and looking intently at him. How close was his face, his angelic face to Cornelius's? And Cornelius was afraid and it's like, what is, what is it, Lord? What, what is it? And the angel said, your prayers and your acts of charity have come up as a memorial offering before God. Your life that you're living is worship. Their life is, is, is worship to God. And he wants you to know that. And so Cornelius, I'm, I'm assuming there was this pause at this moment as Cornelius enters into this worship and this communion. He's scared out of his wits, but if you're going to be scared, be supernaturally scared in the presence of God. So here, this angel, this is not a theophany or anything like this. This is an angel. And now the angel tells him, you know what, Cornelius, there is a, something God wants you to do. He wants you to send men to Joppa and go ask for a person called Simon, who is also named Peter. So Simon Peter, he is lodging with a Simon the Tanner, <laughs> okay, who has a house by the sea. Social media, this is how they're communicating. Here's Google. Hey, you know, Cornelius, I want you to do this and go okay. Instead of telling them anything more, I want you to go, what the Lord is asking me to do is go fetch Simon Peter. All right. So this crazy, and I'm wondering after this moment of crazy, what all of Cornelius's 
people because he had a lot of people around him. So when the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius went and called his household slaves. He said two of his slaves or two of his servants and a very devout soldier, someone who listened and followed him, who I believe was also a God-fearer. That's my imagination, but somebody who attended him and was part of and understood Cornelius was a really, really good godly man. And he explained everything. And here in verse 8 in Acts chapter 10, verse 8, this phrase after explaining this word explain is where we get the, the word exegesis from, same root word. So this detailed extrapolation of this situation that was accurate, he gave a play-by-play -play to the three men, and he sent them, go to Joppa, go find this man, Simon Peter. Which I find really fascinating, Pastor Orlean, because he didn't have to do that. As a man in authority, he no doubt was accustomed to issuing a command without explanation, and people obeyed. Yes. That's, that was True. the deal. And yet, interesting, he made himself vulnerable to two household slaves and this devout soldier. Scripture tells us. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you've just had an angelic encounter. Am I going That's right. to, yes. am I going yes. to doubt your sanity? <laughs> am I going to, you just did what? You were where? Yes. Yeah, what happened to you? Or what do you think happened to you? And so not only did he have this experience and act on this experience, but part of the acting in this experience was really laying himself vulnerable to people who submitted to him who could have really considered him unstable, crazy, mm -hmm. what in the world? And so not only did he obey, but he shared a portion of his life. Yes. He, he bothered to explain and invite them into what he just experienced. Yes. And the authority he had where he operated with that authority, but he also operated caring for his people. And it's yeah. interesting because this gentleman, this guy, this Cornelius, he impacted his community in such a way that we paused here uh, Wednesday night, and I'm just asking, who are the people I am impacting? I mean, we are making an impression, but right. am I impacting anyone? I mean, we all make impressions, whether they're healthy or unhealthy, but hopefully healthy. But here we have a challenge. Looking at Cornelius's life, by the way he chose to live his private life, right. your private life affects your public life. It feed you. There's no way you can, I mean, you can lie for a little bit, but you get a few months and the people around you, they can tell something's not right. And here, nobody had that when they were with Cornelius. This individual who could be just a creep if you want it, and you'd still have to listen to him because he had that type of authority, but he didn't. He, like you said, I didn't think about that, Pastor Robin, that he explained this to them. And so they, wow, this God thing, this is wow. Let's go see if we can really find this Simon Peter in a house by the sea, down by the sea, <laughs> where the watermelons grow. I'm sure they sang that song. <laughs> yeah, for those of you who don't have children, well, you should learn the little thing. I'm not sure what else happens, but it's down by the sea. So or down by, yeah, whatever. It's uh, something yeah. like that. And so they're, they are, I, I want to do this, not just because you are my boss and not just because you're a godly man and I truly respect you. He's made that type of impact that he could ask and they would do it out of relationship instead of out of order, you know, right. out of, of, out of uh, expectation, out of because it's my job, yeah. uh, out of authority. They right. did it out of relationship with him right. and not because of his authority. And how specific was it? I mean, he told him who it was, where it was, where it was near, who he was staying with. I mean, this was a very specific instruction. So it was either going to be very specifically accurate or yes. way off base. <laughs> yes, it's going to be either yes or no. No, maybe. Right. And interesting to note that Simon the Tanner, Simon the Tanner, Simon the Tanner becomes a public stay. If Peter was staying there hoping nobody would notice and it was just a quiet place because nobody would look for him there, if it was a place of retreat, well, that's done. Forever right. done. So, I don't know. Well, and interesting with the tanning profession, the tiny little bit that I know, that is a very stinky process. Very stinky. Everybody in mm -hmm. Simon's neighborhood knew exactly what Simon was doing because they smelled it. Have you ever been downwind from a paper mill? Yes. It yep. was the paper mill. Yes. <laughs> well, that's an interesting point because then that would tell us 
he is down by the sea, but I bet you it's not very public. Mm. That it would probably more of a retreat house, a place where you could go and... Hmm, I wonder. That would make me wonder. Mm -hmm. So as this is happening, there's more. Wait, there's more to the story. We find out in verse 9 here of Acts chapter 10 that Peter is still at Simon the Tanner's house, which we have decided is down by the sea where the watermelon grows, and away from other people, so it's a little bit more in the isolated portion of the countryside, something like that. And so the next day, after this is going on, uh, by the way, there's 32 miles between uh, Joppa and Caesarea. So there's a 32 miles, so this is how far they have to travel. And so the next day, as they were traveling and nearing the cedar, the cedar, nearing the city, City and Peter equal cedar, but it's not what we want to talk about. So as this group of three people were coming in and getting near the city, they made good time, by the way, Peter went up to pray on the housetop of Simon the Tanner's house, which is very, very normal because the housetops were flat. I've been on, on a few housetops like this in the Middle East, and you can see, and if there's a cool breeze in the evening or there's any air movement, it's lovely up there, and they usually had places for shade, and it would be where I would hang out as much as possible, because you can see there's the, the, the sunshine, and you have a great view, because you're, you're elevated up some, and you get a chance, so the very idea that Peter went up there to pray would be totally normal, totally expected, and he went up there and was hungry, so it was about you know time to eat lunch, but he went up there to pray as he's waiting for that, and something strange. It didn't say that he had an angel came to him. It wasn't that. He had what is called a visionary state. He was in some type of trance. It was, who knows? The supernatural came and sat on Peter, and his body froze. So I'm wondering if anybody came up there and seen him. Did somebody come up and say, hey, lunch is ready? <laughs> okay, so he's in this visionary state. How long? I don't know. God has a timetable all, all his own. And he had this strange vision. He had a vision that just captured him and repeated itself, not once, not twice, but three times. Luke is very specific in us noting that this too, not only did Luke write about this experience we're going to be talking about here, three times, but Peter has this happen three times, the same process. He sees heaven opening up and an object that resembles a large sheet coming down. So imagine that you're there, you're hungry, you're praying, and all of a sudden, boom, you can't move, you can't think, you're just breathing, and you see this thing happening. It didn't say that it was in his mind. I'm believing his eyeballs are wide open, and he sees this sheet coming down. I bet you he reached out to try and touch the sheet to see if it's real, or was he frozen? So this big old sheet coming down and being lowered by its four corners to the earth. What was holding up the four corners? It doesn't say. Use your imagination. Who knows? But in the middle of the sheet, all the four-footed animals and reptiles of the earth and the birds of the sky are there. He sees it filled with all these animals. <clears throat> and then he hears this voice that says, get up, Peter. Remember, Peter's hungry. Kill and eat. Okay, a hunter's delight. I mean, what's going on here? And Peter screams out, no, no, Lord. So he knows God is here. Jesus is here, and he's having this conversation. I've never eaten anything common and ritually unclean ever. This, this is not, this is no you're not teaching me to eat that, right? You're teaching me some. No, no, no. My background, no. Mm -mm. No, I, I follow the, this rule. This is no. I would never contaminate myself that way. It happened a second time. So did the sheet disappear when he died? And it came back down. I think for added emphasis, if I'm telling this story, the sheet went poof when he talked, and then it came down again. Peter. Get up, rise up, Peter, kill and eat. And he's like, no, no, Lord. Oh, the echo of the second time. No, I can't do that, Lord. I have never eaten anything common and ritually un unclean. You're asking me to compromise my very self, my history, who I am as a man, my family, my, my standing in the community. I can't. And it happens a third time. And after the third time, then the object was taken up into heaven. So the sheet didn't come down three times. It stayed down there. He repeated himself three times. 
Peter, rise up and eat. So then the sheet was taken back up into heaven, so Peter knew that the trance, this conversation with Jesus was over. And Peter is sitting there. I think Peter forgot about his lunch. He's sitting there trying to contemplate what this might mean. So within the course of all of this, the men who Cornelius sent have come to the house. While Peter is still up there having this, what's going on? What did this mean? All of a sudden there's a... Is this the home of Simon the Tanner? Is Simon Peter residing here? He hears this, and it's like, all right, here we go. Knowing, okay, this is a Jesus thing. The Holy Spirit's doing something, and I've got to do something uncomfortable. Oh, here, here we go. The Lord didn't allow a whole lot of time for Peter to sit there and ruminate and try to pick apart what this meant. The meaning showed up at the front door knocking and yelling for him. They called out, Simon, who's also named Peter, lodging here. So while he was thinking about this, then the spirit told him, didn't tell him what the vision meant. He said, there's three men here looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and accompany them with no doubts at all. No doubts. Be gone, thou doubt, out of my mind, because I've sent them. He doesn't give him an explanation except to go. All right. I wonder if they're carrying sheets. <laughs> I mean, really, what's Peter yeah. thinking? That's I know. I mean, my human brain would be like, I'm going to look and see if they have a big old knapsack on their back. I mean, mm -hmm. he doesn't get the meaning of any of this until these individuals come. And it's interesting. Okay, remember, he is in the Tanner's home who's considered unclean. There's three Gentiles knocking at the door. All right? And they don't leave to go back to Caesarea until the morning. Peter hasn't had lunch yet. There's three guests at the door. Peter invites them in. They stay the night. I mean, mm -hmm. we're talking holy contamination, mm -hmm. Batman. Mm -hmm. And they eat together. Mm -hmm. Unless Peter makes them eat somewhere else. I don't think so, but who knows? It doesn't say. But they are there. Does he make them sleep outside? I don't think so. I'm guessing he invites them in, they eat together, they sleep there, and they get ready in the morning, and they take off to go to Caesarea. So here, if this is going on in the way I think it would, there's contamination, 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 as far as following these very, very strict pharisaical rules about how right. to be a godly person in the community. Right. And so here we have Peter um, having this episode up on the roof, and after making that exclamation you say of no lord i have never eaten anything common or ritually unclean in verse 15 it says a voice said to him what god has made clean you must not call common that's yes you yes. must yes. not call common yes. okay so what god has made clean you must not call common okay and then knock that's knock right. knock unclean right. shows up at the that's door right. yes what yes, yes. Yes. We're having the, you're having this conversation about unclean, and I'm hearing unclean called at the door. Yes. Huh. What do so, I do so about was this? So was that his? Well, just come on in and eat with me, and let's... Obviously, there's something God is changing here, and right. I'm used to this... Oh, yes. Yeah. But it is confronting his very identity yeah. as an Israelite, as, as a Jewish man. <laughs> And I love how specific the Holy Spirit gets in verse 20. Get up. <laughs> Get up. We're done. Go downstairs. We're done. And accompany them with no doubts at all. Yes. Um, but my mind, yes. I've got a, a, a doubts. Go yes. Yes. Here's all these doubts. Wait, and you're giving me, you're giving yes. me definite instruction to get up right now, go downstairs right now, and accompany them. What? <laughs> yes. <laughs> go. Yes. <laughs> oh. I just think about, you know, the, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I know, I, I probably won't ever understand or feel the magnitude of the paradigm shift that's just exploding in Peter's mind right now from what they culturally were doing and what the Lord is instructing him to do right now, just because it was so stark of a difference in how they navigated each other. But... I am so appreciative now 
of the repetition of the Lord. Yes. That he gave him this vision three times. I'm so grateful that Luke wrote this thing down and captured the whole angst of the situation and how really crazy this God situation was. Yes, yes. So thank you, Lord, that we have all of this. <laughs> and the humanity of Peter exactly. is just so easy to understand. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, yeah, thanks for repeating yourself <clears throat> three times. Mm-hmm. Thanks mm-hmm. for telling me to stop contemplating, get up and move and do, that right. this vision is an action yep. you're asking of me. And I love that. I'm glad you brought that verse 15 up because it was stated last night, and we paused there, because this is the crux of what Peter is learning. What God has made clean, you must not call common. I mean, I'm teaching you something new. I am training you to look at something that is part of your historical culture. And so the, we'll be getting to that conversation in just a bit, the idea of who you are historically. But when it comes to who we are as a church body, those things are just part of you, your personal history. Right. Love them. Right. Your personal choice but they're not what I am telling people to do anymore. Things have changed. So here we have, I mean, we're talking a systemic shift. I mean, the whole earth is moving underneath them. So here Peter is having this. They spend the night, they get up and they go. Now, Cornelius is busy while this is happening. He knows this is going to happen. So he's getting his house ready and he invites all his people and he seems to have quite a bunch of people, I think, that they came and... They're ready, and they're there at his house, which I think is probably a very large house, so I'm sure he filled it with his people because he's had all this time. They've seen he's a godly man. So he has a mixture of individuals there. It is important that we note that Luke is very specific in letting us know that this is Roman culture. So when Cornelius leaves in a, in a year, he's going to be bringing his faith with him wherever he goes. So Cornelius is a man in a place at a time where God is using him specifically for what he has for the future. Cornelius is just loving up on God, uh, following what he's learning, realizing, you know, there's more to this life than what is here on, in my earthly eyes. There is a creator. I'm a supernatural being. I want to understand this. And he is learning and doing, making the steps that he can to understand what it is really being a supernatural person, having this temporary physical experience. So he is calling all these people to his house, getting things ready. And here was the question I brought up to the group at the time. What would have happened? If Peter said no, or if Peter said, I'm going to send John, or if Peter would have said, I can't. I mean, he's human. He, would, he could say whatever he wanted at this point. And there would be Cornelius waiting. And let's say John showed up. Well, John's great, but the Lord said he was sending Peter. Where's Peter? It wouldn't have had anywhere near the same. I mean, we're talking seismic change. Exactly. And so the the idea of of, of being obedient in these small, quote, quote, small things and being obedient in these weird things, being obedient in going and loving and doing. And all Peter is being asked is to go with them. I'm going to have you bring the experiences you've had up till now, and you're going to be sharing those experiences, whatever they are. I'm not asking you to, you know, grow another nose or do anything like that or, you know, grow another eyeball, you know, on the back of your, your, your neck. You know, I'm not asking anything like that. I'm just asking you to be you, but go there and be you. Right. And, and he wasn't asking for um, you to spend a whole bunch of money and create an event. He wasn't, yes. he wasn't yes. asking for monetary sacrifice. He wasn't asking for, um, I don't know, crazy Correct. Something. Um, he wanted him to go share his previous experience. Yes. Go talk. Yes. And share. Yes. Relationship. Exactly. Relationship. Relationship. Yeah. And I did repeat it three times. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I found I found even more ad- admiration for Cornelius when Scripture in verse twenty four says, "Now Cornelius was expecting them, and had called together his relatives and close friends." How encouraging! Yeah. Because he totally acted upon. Yes. What he saw. Yes. He had technically no confirmation yet. Correct. No confirmation. And yet he decided to step on that, um, I don't know, uh, what's the thing? Uh, diving board. He, he yeah. just launched yes. off the diving board, trusting that God was going to do. He acted on that and made preparation because he totally made himself vulnerable to, um, okay, what if he heard God wrong? Right. Right. What if he heard God wrong? And now he's got all of these people and relatives and close friends at his place. And he's pulling together this 
episode for people to come and hear. And if he got it wrong, he's going to be yep. embarrassed. Yep. That's going to impact him and his standing in the community, his word from then on out. It really didn't seem to matter. Cornelius moved on it. Yes. No doubt. Yep. All kind of faith. It's Way already done. Cornelius. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that is part of his character being revealed. Yeah. He may have been a, a Roman soldier, but as a man and part of the community, they, they got to watch his faith. And this is not the first time, I'm, I'm sure, they've seen his faith in action because he had a lot of people. He had close friends. He had relatives in the area. And so they were there, and he wanted those people close to him to experience this with him. And if God is going to go to all of this effort, yes, something big that's worth your time is coming. I need you to be here. And I have shared with you my journey, and we're all on this journey together. Yeah. Let's take this next step. Yeah, Together we have the space. Let's fill it up. And so here comes Peter. You know, they wake up in the morning. They have breakfast. So they had lunch, dinner, and breakfast together. All right? So he's just all contaminated up by now, <laughs> hanging out with these Gentiles. And so... <laughs> And it's really hard to find something in our culture that would help me understand this. And, and I do understand culture and history, family history, but the shaky ground where it is so embedded, where you're not the same person when you walk away from that. And I didn't want to take too much time trying to define that because all of us have differences now. Back in the day, there was more of this. But there's differences of how, but here there really wasn't. This is what defined who you were. Your identity was embedded in this. So you're asking me to change my identity, how I perceive myself as part of my culture, part of my people. So we're talking shaky, shaky ground. And so Peter gets up and walks on it, and he walks out of the city with three Gentiles. But oh, wait, not alone. There were six other men from the group of believers from the church that went with him, which is very, very important to note. Peter did not go alone. He brought six fellow believers with him. Which is so fascinating because here we have Peter in a completely different circumstance stepping out on the water and walking with Jesus. Yes. Yes. Good. Yep. Good. Can I, yep. You yep. know, it's like, am I going to sink? Am, am I going to sink? Walk? Am mm -hmm. I going to walk? But I've got this history with Jesus where if he says I can do it, Yes. I'm stepping out of the boat. And there goes Peter. <laughs> here Way we to go. go, Peter. And he's hauling nine other people with him. Let's go on the waves, man. <laughs> so he walks, they get there. Who knows what kind of conversations, excuse me, hmm. what kind of conversations they had on the road because you cannot not talk. I mean, road trips are how you really get to know someone. You can be best friends with someone you can road trip well with. So you have this wonderful road trip. And he walks in the house, and in my imagination, they say, but here, you know, they, there's a process to get into a Roman centurion's house. So he knows he's coming. So by the time he gets there, Cornelius he sees him, and he runs to Peter, and he falls down at his feet and worships him. And Peter makes a declarative statement that changes the atmosphere of the room. It says, stand up. I myself am also a man. But no, 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 he doesn't just say that. It says that Peter helps, Cor he touches the Gentile, helps him, the Roman occupier, the enemy of their, he touches this person, helps them up. I'm saying he hugged him. Mm -hmm. I'm going with a hug. Mm -hmm. I and you are equal, is Peter saying. We, we are the same. We are the same. Peter has no idea what he's doing. What he's seen in the vision is just starting to happen by his obedience of walking there. Wait a minute, you can't worship me like you worship Jesus. Get up, I'm just a man like you. I mean, that, that would be the statement you would make, forgetting the dude's a Roman and he's a centurion and all of this. It's like, no. So they're having this physical interaction that everyone can see, and everybody's going, whoa, whoa, look at this Peter guy, whoa. And so while they're talking, he went in and he found that many had come together. So he's seen, wow, this guy knows a lot of people. Look at him. This guy took this serious. Whoa, wait a minute. Now what's God going to You know, I showed up and I was going to do Bible study, but now I'm going to preach a sermon. Hello. You know? <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, if he's thinking he's going to Cornelius' house and just sit down and have dinner with Cornelius. Mm -hmm. What a big surprise. Yes, yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Peter actually tells them, you know, it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit with a foreigner. But God has shown 
that I must not call any person common or unclean. I, I wonder what kind of words we would substitute for today's mm -hmm. worthless. Mm -hmm. I'm not allowed to call a person worthless or too sinful or, I mean, this, he's making this declarative statement, okay, this is what's happened. And then in verse 29, it says, that's why I've come without any objection when I was sent for. So I ask, why'd you send for me? Hey, Cornelius, what's up? I want to know, you know, what you need from me. <laughs> And so then he gets to hear Cornelius' reply. <laughs> well, and I love this because the uh, outside of helping him up and, and getting them squared away as equals, mm -hmm. Peter heads right into, we're going to address together here the elephant in the room. Yeah. We're going to talk about this is forbidden, you know, this never does, yes. this is what God says, now what? Yes. So yeah. he, he yes. totally doesn't bypass it. He doesn't assume everybody else there is on that same page. He gets everybody on the same page with that statement. Oh, and he doesn't try to say, well, I have learned in my relationship with Jesus to do. He said, no, God confronted me and told me to get my butt on the road and go do this. I mean, he's telling me to watch my, and now we know that because Peter has seen the Samaritan Pentecost, that Peter has watched all of this stuff up to this point. <clears throat> that God is saying there's a change, there's a change. He didn't start out with the great big Cornelius. He worked his way up to Cornelius. And so Peter has this vision, and he shares it here, and he's letting them all know, journey, we're all on this journey. We're journeying together because this is crazy town. Mm -hmm. Let's go see what's on the train. So Cornelius tells them what happened. You know, I was at, I was in the Tamid praying and, you know, at Tamid time and I was doing this and you know, my continual prayers, my perpetual prayers. So however you would define that in their culture, I can tell I am ignorant here. So he's communicating. Peter gets to know that Cornelius is a God-fearer and he has done this. And in the process of worshiping God, he has this crazy experience in his obedience of just loving God. It's like, I love you, God. I want to please you. I, I want to worship you. I, I want to interact with you. I want to know as much of you as I can here on this planet so when I meet you in eternity, I'm ahead of the crowd and I can just run and I, I don't want to go through this life without you. And so here Cornelius, my words, has having this experience, he's explaining to Peter and Peter gets to see that Cornelius and God have a relate. Yahweh sees Cornelius. Wow. Wow, so Cornelius is having visions like I'm having visions. He got to see an angel, and I got to see a sheet with animals in it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, if I right. was there, I would start comparing. Right. Well, yeah. he had huh. a great big experience of that, and, and I saw this, and oh, man, 1 plus 1 equals 15, and God, God math, and now what's going on? So he told me to send someone to Joppa and invite Simon, who's called Peter, and he's lodging with Simon the Tanner. At which point Peter realizes he can't stay anywhere because God knows where he's at and he's going to obviously let people know. So, you know, I'm, there's no such thing as a retreat in my world. So whatever he was doing in the house by the sea, he was there. And so I immediately sent for you and, and you did the right thing, Peter. This is weird. Cornelius is telling this big old disciple guy that you did the right thing in coming. Because you know what? All these people here, we are present before God and we want to hear everything you have to say to us everything you've been commanded by the Lord. We want to know what it was like to be you. We want to know who is, who and what you know. I don't. I don't. There's no Jesus mentioned here. They have no concept of the Messiah, in my understanding. It's so interesting to me, Pastor O, how they just in hearing Cornelius bringing Peter up to speed with why the invitation actually came. Yes. You know Peter is going, wow, confirmation, confirmation, oh, oh, yes. confirmation, confirmation. You mean God got that specific? So here Peter was at Simon Tanner's house, um, and he's doing whatever it is he's doing there, and at the same time, God is in a completely different location talking to this God fear, <laughs> telling him, <clears throat> pardon me, very specific things. And Peter obeyed. Yes. Wow. Yes. And <laughs> you, can, you can tell it's Thursday morning. Both of us had a busy Wednesday night, so we're sucking down the what we call Jesus drops Jesus around drops. here uh -huh. <laughs> to keep our throats from seizing up on us. It's interesting because... It's obedience. Mm -hmm. Peter obeyed. But when I look at it through the relationship lens, 
both Cornelius and Peter are having a continual ongoing relationship mm -hmm. of just loving Jesus and loving others for Jesus. And Cornelius doesn't know Jesus yet. He's about to meet him. And there is this process of relationship. And instead of seizing, it's like, oh, what do you need me to do? Obedient, I need to be obedient. It's like, no, when you're in relationship with someone, there's things you, you do for your kids, your grandkids, you, you do for your husband, your wife, you do for the people you love. I mean, there's things that you do for your people that you normally wouldn't do because you wouldn't have thought of it or it wasn't a need of yours, but you are naturally going to do it because it's a need of theirs. And so this wonderful idea of connecting and this is, well, I, I, I care for you. I'm your friend. I, I care for you. So yeah, of course I, I can come pick you up and drop you off. Oh, oh, you need what you need. Oh, you need someone to help you. You have surgery. You have this going on. Sure. I can. How about this? I can do this piece. Can I help with this? Or, oh no, I need to come in and we need to orchestrate childcare. We need, oh, I can do that. We can. So all of these different things we don't think much about except how do I get them done? But when it comes to the supernatural relationship things, hey, by the way, I need you to go to this person's house. You're not going to want to go because he's considered unclean in your historical understanding of loving people and which was a way to worship me back then. But now I've added this. This is a new thing. So I want you to do this. Yes, I want you to. And Jesus told him. He prepped him. It wasn't like, oh, surprise. Remember, Jesus did go to Samaria, sat at the well, ministered to this woman who was considered a woman of ill repute, which was a big no-no, right? Big no-no. Oh, my goodness. You talk about social media. If they would have got a hold of that and that picture. Because, you know, Jesus was talking to her out at the well by himself for quite a while. So this is really, whoa. All right. You've probably been about kicked out of quite a few <clears throat> organ organizations <laughs> having this conversation. So here... Peter, in relationship, I want you to do this. It doesn't fit with your understanding, but I want you to go forward and I want you to talk to this individual. It wasn't a sin. This is not a sin. I want you to sin. This isn't what Peter is doing. These are cultural precedents that help define him as a man. All right? The Pharisees made these rules around the Ten Commandments, telling you to not do these so you don't break the Ten Commandments. Peter is not breaking a commandment. They just had all these safety rules around those Ten Commandments because they wanted to worship in purity. And so they kept them safe. They helped define who they were as a people for years and years and years. And they were respected and loved. I understand that. So Peter isn't sinning. God is not asking Cornelius nor Peter to sin. He's telling them, I'm shaking who you are as a person. I'm not going against anything scripture says. I'm shaking who you are as a person, and I'm asking you to do this. All right? And, and what's interesting, Pastor, oh, sorry to yeah. interrupt. What's interesting is for both of these men of integrity who yes. were honoring the culture that they were in in the way that they knew, it was the Holy Spirit that created the bridge. Yes. For both of them. Yes. To be able to walk over. Yes. And meet together. Yes. So... They're being asked to do something in this relationship with people. So there's a defining facet to this miracle of, all right, care for these people. Do So here we go in verse 34. Peter began to speak. Oh, wow. Now I really understand that God doesn't show favoritism. I know. I stopped dead in my tracks right there, too. Now I really, because I can, I can just imagine <laughs> Peter know. having a moment. You know, he's, know. here's Cornelius and he's rolling yep. out with what we would call his testimony. Yep. Yep. You know, how he, the supernatural experience that just kind of landed on his lap, you know, hello yes. angel. What? Yes. Yes. Um, now I really, now I really understand. Now I really understand. Now I really understand. Knock, knock, putting head. Yes. Oh my yeah. goodness. That yes. God does not show favoritism. It's like. Whoa. Oh, Lord. You are my family now. Yeah, yep. exactly. And then he clarifies about in verse 35, but in every nation, the person who fears him, the person who fears the Lord, which means loves the Lord, honors the Lord, worships the Lord, and does righteousness, it shows in his actions. That's why there was the detail about Cornelius' life. He not just went, he wasn't someone who was overseeing the people who went to church with them so they would like him. It changed his life. He lived in his private life. A life of worship. So all those people there understood this. Peter is now recognizing this. In every nation that a person who loves God, fears him, and does righteousness, has a life that shows it, is acceptable to him. It is a choice that we make. It isn't a genetic thing that happens to us when we're born. He sent the message to the Israelites proclaiming the good news. We owe a huge debt to them as a nation. 
of peace through Jesus Christ, and he is Lord of all. So here Peter starts to preach the sermon about who Jesus is. And he goes back and makes the connection and why Jesus died on the cross and this idea of, of bridging the Old Testament with the New Testament. And while he is preaching, it says in verse 44, while Peter was still preaching these words, Gentile Pentecost happened. This building, this room, this house is filled with Gentiles. And the Holy Spirit came down on all who heard the message. So we can infer from this, we can take from this, that there's something that happened that they heard. It said in verse 46, they heard them speaking in other languages and declaring the greatness of God. So these people have a Holy Ghost moment, baptism in the Holy Spirit that we call it now, and they're speaking in tongues. They're doing all this, they're worshiping, and, and <laughs> Peter's just standing there. It's like, huh. Would you look at that? Yeah. <laughs> the upper room, Samaria, now here in Caesarea, huh, mm -hmm. God has no favorites. Look at this. Mm -hmm. Crazy town, crazy town, crazy town. And the six people that came with Peter, guess where they are? Mm -hmm. They're right in the middle of this. Mm -hmm. It's not just Peter's testimony. And it's not the three men from Joppa, you know, the two, two servants and the, and the, the soldier guy, because they're going to, soldier guy is going to follow Cornelius when he leaves. And so here we see there's a connection with Rome that the message is going to get to Rome. Luke is specific. He wants us to know that that's, this message is going to get to Rome. What better conduit than Cornelius, this honorable, godly man? And so the circumcised believers, it says in 45, these people of ancestral worship to the Lord had come with Peter, and they were astounded because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. So they're there with their jaws dropped watching this, experiencing this, crying, how could you not cry right. in the spirit watching this? Can anyone prevent these people from being baptized in water, making a public declaration of their belief? So here, Cornelius is expecting a college class, and he gets a touch of heaven that changes him from the inside out. Mm -hmm. Who you are as a man will never be the same. You mm -hmm. are on the right track now. Instead of worshiping me, you now you know me. Mm -hmm. Now you know me, and I'm going to mess in your life just as I did with Peter. I am curious. What happened to Cornelius? No kidding. Well, and it, I think it's interesting because, you know, uh, you laid out the dots of, uh, of Peter. And when Peter says, now I really understand that God doesn't show favoritism, but in every nation, the person who fears him and does righteousness is acceptable to him. Um, wait a minute. Huh. It's interesting, Peter, because why didn't you say, but in Rome? Mm -hmm. Because he was dealing with a Roman person. Yes. So why didn't he just stop there? The paradigm had been completely shattered. So this is Peter yes. recognizing, yes. okay, so now I know, oh my goodness, Romans are acceptable to the Lord. He didn't bother stopping <laughs> at that bus stop. Yes. He just went yes. all the way to every yes. nation yes. and person that fears the Lord and does righteousness. And so I just, I, I am appreciating that he started here, went to here, went to here, and then just realized, oh no, there's, there's, this isn't, we're not talking just about Rome. We're talking about everywhere. 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 The people yes. in Tonga, Fiji, everywhere. I mean. Mm -hmm. People in Minnesota mm -hmm. who say it like Minnesota. Minnesota. Yeah, so those crazy people. Mm -hmm. So there is this just paradigm shattered. I mean, it is so hard to explain. You are no longer the same person you were when you came to this house. So uh, we went back and we talked a little bit uh, uh, with the Wednesday night crew. Why did Jesus spend so much time on developing Peter's character? When we, the, the, the small glimpse we get in the New Testament, there's so much that happened that we don't know, that he continually pushed Peter into growth areas, into growing up, into learning what he doesn't know, changing what he thought was a bedrock reality. These are processes that Jesus started and, are, and continued because he needed to get Peter here. Without this experience, we wouldn't be here today, Pastor That's right. Robin. That's exactly this idea of right. understanding that Peter had to say yes to growth in the uncomfortable, to letting go of things that defined who he was that really weren't, they weren't, what would you say, they weren't culturally there was no book uh, there acceptable was no, anymore. Yeah. I mean, they're still defining him as, as a man, and that's a beautiful part of his heritage. Mm -hmm. And I can embrace my heritage because that's who I am. But I can't tell you that you have to be like that. Mm -hmm. You have to do exactly like this or you can't have this. Right. So that mindset, which was part of their normal, 
It's part of their pride, their civic and national pride, their, and understandable. There's nothing wrong with that. It's when we take that and say that you must have it just like me in order to have this. Right. Because we're coming down to this argument where people are starting to say, wait a minute, Peter. Wait a minute, Peter. 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 So here, Peter is put in a really uncomfortable spot. But it had to be Peter. Peter is the one who had to show up. He is the leader of the church at this time. And it is Peter who had to be there. Peter who brought all the experiences he had with Jesus. Peter who walked in relationship. Peter who sinned and denied Christ. Peter who was forgiven. Peter who was poked. Peter who was prodded. That person, everything that happened in his life to that point. Because remember, Peter knew Jesus, in my opinion. They knew each other as kids. They knew each other. They're around. Okay, they are probably related. <laughs> okay, somehow connected. Cousin second removed. That person had to be the one who was there to look Cornelius in the face and say, wow, God doesn't show favoritism. It had to be him. So my question is, is we were having in the Wednesday night crew last night, do I allow myself, do I put myself in places that are going to cause me to grow? Do I allow myself to go to the uncomfortable? Do I see someone crying in a store and ask if they're okay? Do I, I mean, uncomfortable not unsafe, but uncomfortable situations. Right. Do I feel that God's asking me to go bring my neighbor this? Am I supposed to offer to watch that person's children? Am I all these uncomfortable? I know this is nowhere near what Peter had to face doing this. But the concept of us as humans, where we are in our faith, this equation of how God relates to us isn't any different for us. We are not Peter. But the same type of relationship principles are there. For us to grow and to love others as Jesus wants us to, it's going to be uncomfortable. We're going to be put in places we don't want to be. It makes me wonder, it was this stereotype that God wanted Peter to break. Yes. What stereotype does he want us to break? Oh, there you go. And how do we do that in, in normal relationship? in just the every day of what God is calling us to do. Because honestly, I am struck with this with Peter. Like you said, he had every every opportunity to say, no, I'm not doing that. I am not going there. I'm not doing that. You're asking me too much. I, I, can't, I can't, I can't. I'm not doing that. And yes. yet, because he chose to be brave in his relationship with Jesus and lean into trusting him that if you're asking me to do this, if this is something you're calling me to do, You're going to meet me there. You're going to equip me there. You're going to show up in exactly what that moment needs. I don't have it right now, or I don't think I have it. I'm just going to go show up. If Peter had chosen any other thing, that choice to not grow would have a negative impact on all kinds of other people. And it gives me pause of, okay, Lord, where am I frightened to go with you? Where am I choosing to not be brave? And... Are other people going to be negatively impacted because I'm nervous to do that with you? Could someone else experience greater freedom in Jesus if I just said yes? Yes. Because Peter went and had basically, I mean, I realized there were a whole lot of, there's a whole lot associated with this. But boiling it down, Peter went and had a conversation with Cornelius Yes. And the people in Cornelius' house. He had a conversation with a dude. Yes. And everything was transformed. What if he calls us to have a conversation with someone? Yes. And share our Jesus story. And share our Jesus story. Stories, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And this is echoing in my head. I had a wonderful opportunity to work on a project with someone I don't normally see all the time yesterday. And they asked me, well, how did you end up here? (laughs) <laughs> and that got to be a great conversation. And we ended up finding out some really unusual places we had common ground. I'm very excited about what the Lord is allowing that conversation to build. Okay, Lord, what kind of bridge are you building here so maybe I can help this person get closer to your heart? Yes. And in this facet of find out who they are and what they're designed for. It's not like we want to sell Jesus to people. No. It's like, no, no, no. This is the person who created the puzzle of who you are. Right. You find missing pieces, this is the person who you ask. Mm-hmm. You don't like that piece, this is the person you complain to. He wants relationship with you. We're not selling you Jesus. We want right. you to meet 
the person who created you so you can realize who you all are and what you have and have access to that help when you're walking through hard. Because say it a gazillion times, this isn't heaven. Yeah. This life here on earth is not heaven. This is hard. And one of the things that is beautiful about a relationship, a supernatural relationship with God, is that relationship can help you walk through the natural. Mm -hmm. It helps you get through. Because this life isn't supposed to be this, whoa, whatever, you know, I mean, we would all like it to be this wealthy in a community, all the people love us type. And it doesn't work that way. There's hard. Yeah. And so here, I want you to understand who you are. I want you to see yourself through this lens that you don't have. Here, take this and look and see who Jesus really is. Find out this for yourself. Build this relationship and see just how crazy I am not. And I love <laughs> that Peter did not allow his insecurity to stop him from moving forward in Jesus. Yes. Because his insecurity in this circumstance could have halted this circumstance for Cornelius. Oh, but wait, there's more, Pastor Robert. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> there's a few pieces here that timeline, this is where, yeah, just don't follow a timeline. Just realize these things happened in Peter's life. There is an opportunity where Peter is in Antioch and he's working with the, the church in Antioch. And I insert it here so we can understand that this, this helps us understand the problem in, in Acts chapter 15. And here, while he's in Antioch, we're not sure I'm guessing he may have ended up there because in Acts chapter, no, that's Galatians 2. Peter disappears on us here. In Acts chapter 12, Peter is arrested by King Herod because this is where John's brother James is killed by King Herod. And the people go crazy and they love it. They're just nuts. And here is where Peter gets arrested, and there's a miracle that happens, and he ends up coming back to the house to tell them, I'm out of jail, and, and the 16 soldiers that were guarding him are all going to, be, King Herod kills them all because Peter escaped. Here the angel came and took Peter and whoever was supernatural, because it's not time for Peter to die, because as we've deciphered that Peter is needed as, and so he disappears out of the area. So I'm guessing that this crazy thing that happened. The church is praying for him. They see this happen. He comes and he tells them. The girl that answers the door at the house shuts it in his face and goes, tells Peter's at the door, and they think she's nuts, and she's, ah, and they're there, and he's there, and he tells them, I got to go. I just want to let you know what the Lord did, and off they go. King Herod goes crazy. He kills the guards, and then he leaves the area. So Herod doesn't want to face this. Here he thought he's going to, now nah, I'm going to kill Peter and everyone's going to love me. They're going to, and it was the night before Peter was going to die and the angel does this. So that happens here, okay? But somewhere in this, from being arrested there, is that what sent Peter to Antioch? Because there is this problem of Bruin. Okay, Peter falters, this amazing leader who went through this experience with Cornelius who is already being led this, because there's the Samaritan Pentecost and the Gentile Pentecost, and now in Galatians 2, Paul, Paul is just lit. I tell you, in my head, Paul's a small dude, intense. My dad was a slight man, and I could just see, he's this little guy, just all a bundle of, just, and he's, and Peter, who we call Cephas, this is the Greek phrase for Peter, and he uses this, or the Aramaic phrase for Peter. So Cephas is Peter in a different language. And so here they're having, it's like Paul is telling him, I had to confront Peter. Now, in my head, Peter's a big dude, and Paul's a little dude. And I have Paul looking up at Peter, and he can see up Peter's nostrils. <laughs> he can, because he's that tall. And Paul is looking at him, and he's like, Peter, what in the world are you doing? How can you, don't you remember? Cornelius! Here, Peter is down in Antioch, and he is ministering to everyone. And -doo 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 -doo, this group of Judaizers come from Jerusalem. They are historic, Hebraic Jewish believers who follow the Torah, and they're coming. And Peter is going into Gentiles' homes and eating. I mean, this is a huge deal eating with them. When you eat with someone, they are your family. How can you? The Torah said, Peter, Peter, Peter. What happened? Because Peter went and did, I'm assuming, the standard cleansing of being unclean, and he wouldn't eat with them anymore. And not just Peter, every single Jewish believer, including Barnabas, joined him. 
And they created a schism in the church. They caused a division in this growing church. So Paul is also in the area. Paul comes up to him, up his nose. Peter, how dare you? You are dividing the church. You are going against what the Holy Spirit wants. How dare you? So he, he reads him the riot act right, right up his nose. Now, Peter could have, if he wanted to, he could have led a totally different church experience. He could have walked away and been the supreme head of the Jewish, Christian, whatever it would have turned out to be. Mm -hmm. But Peter, accustomed to the Holy Spirit's leading, made a stupid human decision out of fear that is just embedded in his character. It is just part of who he is. And he kept mixing up what was cultural and what was spiritual, and what God wanted from, and what was part a beautiful part of his upbringing and his heritage. So here, we find that Peter does repent because we see Peter, the very same things that Paul said to Peter in Galatians 2, Peter regurgitates later on in Acts chapter 15. So we know that this happened, but somewhere in this process, <laughs> Acts chapter 11 happens, there is this argument within the church when Peter went up to Jerusalem to tell them about what happened with Cornelius. And they all look at him and said, you visited uncircumcised men and you ate with them? End of listening. You are contaminated. Don't come near me. Don't touch me. I want to go into the temple. I don't want you touching me. Go away. You're going to make me dirty. You're going to make me dirty. You're going to make me dirty. And Peter says, wait a minute, before you go there, brothers, let me tell you this crazy story. Let me tell you what the Holy Spirit did. And he walks them through. And not just Peter, the six men that accompanied him, they are there to echo and share their story. You guys, we're there. We watched it. We seen the Gentile Pentecost. I'm telling you, we didn't ask it to happen, but we knew the Holy Spirit had sent us there. So what are we supposed to do? <laughs> And Peter said, you know, I, I just tried speaking to him, but when I speak, the Holy Spirit came on. I'm just like us in the beginning. So what am I supposed to do? I'm telling him. I remember the word of the Lord when he said, John baptized with water, but you're going to baptize people with the Holy Spirit. You guys were there. You heard that be said. Therefore, here in Acts chapter 11, if God gave them the same gift that he also gave us when we believed on the Lord, how could I possibly hinder God. How am I going to stop God from doing what he wants? I'm sorry it doesn't fit with your historical paradigm. And when they heard this, they all shut up. I said right there, they all became silent. Interesting to note, mm -hmm. they didn't just stay silent. Here in Acts 11, chapter 18, it says, and then they glorified God. Oh, God, we are so we need you so much. So God has granted repentance resulting in life even to the Gentiles. I mean, the way we thought the world worked no longer works that way anymore. And I'm just seeing in this, I got to say, um, my goodness, Lord, help us, because we just jumped to conclusions. And that whole phrase of what am I supposed to do? You know, when yes. someone has jumped to a conclusion with you. <laughs> yes. Not that they would ever do you that. No, not that that, yeah, but yeah. it's really so interesting. And then you take the time to just roll out the story. You know, this is, this is what happened. Yes. What yes. would, what, you can see the facts just like I can see the facts. What would you have had me do? And so I love that Peter does that because he could have done any number of things. Well, fine, I'm done with you and marched out and. I yes. Mean, who yes. knows? But yes. he explained, which tells me he really cares that these people get the lesson that he was being taught. Yes. You need you need this freedom too. Yes. I get that it's inconvenient. I get that it changes everything. I get but you you need to know this. Yes. Look at how we got here. There is no other con uh, uh, conclusion we can come to yes. because yes. this is what God is doing. Yes. So m my thinking is here this is happening right soon after the Cornelius experience. Then Peter goes down to Antioch and starts his Antioch work, and Paul and Barnabas and Silas, and they're all down there. And that's when Peter falters, when he makes up the thing and where Paul jumps up his nose. So there is this continual argument about what, what can happen and how it's supposed to happen. And 
they can believe in Jesus, but they're not going to be special like uh, us, right? Or they're, there's a secondary, or there. So there's this argument of Moses is going to complete what Jesus did. Because you not only need to believe on Jesus, but you need to be circumcised and follow the laws of the Torah, the, follow Torah. And so <laughs> here we find in Acts chapter 15, so all of this is going on. Cornelius happens. They end up in Jerusalem, and the church goes a bit nutty, but they realize that what happened with Peter, because he has the six witnesses, this is what God is wanting, so we're going to be accepting Gentiles in the Christian church now. All right, here we go. And so he's down in Antioch. Well, there's still this group of people who are not satisfied, and they are going to these small church communities and teaching this lie. They are deceiving, and they cannot let go of their cultural mindset. They cannot grow nor change, and they've had it. I mean, the church has had it. Paul has had it. There is this, I am, I'm just done having this conversation with you guys. I am done listening to this argument. And so we follow here in Acts chapter 15 that Acts chapter 15 one sense sets up the story for us where this concept of respect and love what Moses has done, respect who you are and how you have got here. But there is this controversy that just won't die down, die, die down, this Gentile controversy that they need to become God-fearers in their definition of being circumcised and follow the Torah. So it says in Acts 15, 1, some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom prescribed by Moses, you can't be saved. We are not going to dis Moses in this whole belief system with Jesus. And that's what they felt was happening. But after Paul and Barnabas had engaged them in serious argument and debate, the church arranged for Paul and Barnabas and some others of them to go up to the apostles and elders in Jerusalem concerning this controversy. So they're having a church fight that won't stop. They're having people just, I believe in this, I believe in this, we're going to do this, we're going to have this, we're going to do this. Now where's Peter at this time? I don't know. But he's around and he's doing his thing. And so here, the church community in the Gentile world is sending an entourage to Jerusalem Go get an edict from them. We're not putting up with this anymore. This, And I can just see, because Paul, of all people who understand their heritage, Paul is a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knows all of this. So they're being sent to go talk to them. And so not just Paul and Barnabas, there's other people coming along. <laughs> All right, And they call this council together in Jerusalem and all of the apostles that are... The, that are still alive and those that are are growing and we also have in this entourage Jesus his brother James they call him James the just he is the leader of the Jerusalem church a great leader history says that he did a great job and he was there for a while he didn't believe in Jesus as the Messiah until after his resurrection and so there's this and so James is doing a great job of, so these are the, the the big ones so they're having this conversation and this argument this fight and all of a sudden the apostles and the elders are assembled to consider this matter. What in the world are we going to do with the Gentiles in the church? And this idea of our, our heritage and what we're taught. And how do we respect Moses and the Torah and all of this? What are we going to do? There had been much debate. <laughs> I love it. Acts 15 verse 7 says, and after there had been much debate, which means there was nonstop arguing, this is the way that, don't you, do, 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 do. And Peter stands up. Not John. Not anyone else. Peter stands up. This is, the per the, this is the man who had to stand at the moment. He is the lightning rod. And remember, him and Paul got in an argument because Peter gave in and faltered. And it just the Judaizers, he just, I love my upbringing. I love living as a Jew. And not realizing you can, but you don't have to tell everyone else they need to as well. It is not how you fall in love with God. You guys had the wonderful heritage of knowing this. Now, these individuals get to know God as well, but they don't have to follow that cultural history. You so don't have to be a Jew first in order to become a Christian. There you go. Mm -hmm. You don't have, Yes, and so that's really hard. And so Peter stood up. It had to be Peter. And he said, hey, brothers, you're aware that in the early days God made a choice among you and that by the mouth, and that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the gospel message and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as Cornelius, Cornelius, Cornelius. Peter stands up and says, Cornelius, Cornelius. He made no distinction. We can't call common what he says is not. 
All right? So he says that, that you, you can't treat these things as detestable when he says that they're beloved by him. He made no distinction between us and them. He has no favorites. And then he says, now, in verse 10, why are you testing God? Why are you testing us? So he goes on and he gives the same sermon that Paul gave him up his nose in Antioch. And he says, hey, Paul's right. Peter could have divided the church. And he's like, no, this isn't going to happen. We are going to adhere to what scripture says. No division on my watch, boys and girls. So he's having this argument with them. Why are you trying to put on these Gentile believers the yoke that our ancestors could bear? We could not be faithful to those rules. This is why Jesus came. And now you're saying that you have to follow these rules and love Jesus? Wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. You can't do both. They both don't lead to salvation. These things define us as a culture, but they did not help us be pure. So we believe we're saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the same way that they are. So that once again, the whole crowd of arguing people fell completely silent. This happened in Acts 11, and now we're here again, boys and girls. We need to settle this. And then Barnabas and Paul got up and said, okay, you guys want to hear more? This is what happened after Cornelius. Come on, let us tell you we don't know what they said. They told him some things are listed here, but you got to listen. This happened, and this miracle happened, and there's this going on, and then there's this. And you're telling me this isn't of the Holy Spirit? You're telling me this isn't anointed by God? These individuals are not circumcised, and these people do not follow the Torah, but these people love Yahweh. They love God. They love Jesus. They know that this is the Messiah. So walking through all this, and then they sit down. Then James the Just stands up and says, well, we need to make a decision. Because this isn't going to happen anymore. We are now organizing ourselves to the point where there needs to be a declaration. We're not going to argue about this anymore. This is done here. This line, this or after this, if you bring this up, you are no longer part of the church because the church isn't going to tolerate this. We have to protect what God is doing. We have to make a declaration. And so they do. They make a compromise. They compromise for both sides to get along. We're talking about entrenched beliefs about how we live. And the problem doesn't just come to how they want to live. But if I want to go have dinner with you as a Gentile, I can't go to the temple for how many weeks? I have to go through all of this decontamination process. So there is this, in my judgment, it says in verse 19, we should not cause difficulties for those among the Gentiles who turn to God. We can't make them become Jewish. That's silly. But instead, we should write to them. And this is what we can tell them. These are the arguments you're having. Because they had to go in great detail, detail ad nauseum, about what, how it was like to live in this community with these Gentiles who were impure. And then they wanted to go to the synagogue or go to the temple and all the things. They're making our life. How do I know? So here's the list. Here's the four things. And we talked about this. <laughs> and I know this podcast can go on forever because I tell you, this is such a pivotal point in the way the church was formed. Right here, there's a compromise. Okay? There's no sin here. All right? there, this is a crazy list. Number one, abstain from things polluted by idols. You know, you can't go down to the idol fight at five and dime. The stuff that were offered to idols that they take and they sell to help that whatever idol place is, the, that temple of that false god, and they're going to make money. And there's those who are like, yeah, oh, I don't worship that god, but I'm going to the five and dime and I'm going to get the meat, you know, hey. It's 50% off of what you have to pay in the other store. You know, Walmart can't even beat that price. So they're going to go get that, and they're going to get whatever's there that's cheap, and it doesn't, whatever. But here, in your cultural background, you're not allowed to. So if they come over for dinner and you bought your meat at the idol store, they're stuck. So they can insult you and receive that cultural insult on them that they were so disrespectful to you that they didn't eat the food. But if they eat the food, they're contaminated. It's a problem. You're forcing me to live how I don't want to live. And I'm forcing you to live how you don't want to. I mean, so we're stuck. So the only thing we can do is not be together. We, we just won't be church together. We won't talk to each other. We'll live on opposite sides of the city. We'll do, and the church is like, uh-uh, you're not going to do that. This is an answerable issue. We can figure this out. Seriously. Jesus rose again. This doesn't take resurrection power. This just takes human compromise. This just takes this idea of getting along and loving someone else by limiting your life, which is so anti-American, I tell you. So here, abstain from things polluted by idols. Abstain from sexual immorality. That's a sin that we all understood, all right? But also abstain from eating anything that has been strangled. All right, that's part of the 
Hebraic culture and part of the, what is required of how meat is handled and processed, and from blood, Simon the Tanner. All right. So there is this. These are things as a Gentile lover of Jesus. You have to realize if you do them and you have your Jewish brothers and sisters over, you are contaminating them according to their cultural history. Is that kind? Is that Christian? Exactly. <laughs> what are you going to do here? This concept of, I'm asking you, I'm, this is an edict written on paper because when Paul and Barnabas bring it back, the church, Gentile church goes, yeah, they go nuts. They worship, they have a party saying, that's it. We can easily do that. We love our church community. And if this is what it takes, and I know that if I've been unclean, and I'm not, I'm not going to do that if I know this is what the argument is, this is an easy peasy lemon squeezy answer. But is it? Limiting your own life. So how do we limit? This was the, our conversation. There were two things we talked about in Romans as we were closing up on Wednesday. As you can tell, I'm looking for my notation. We talked about Romans 8.32 where it talks about Paul is telling us that God didn't even spare his own son but offered him up for us all, A-L-L. -L. The argument about is who, who is that all? Who is that all? So we had a conversation of do I include myself in that all? Did, did Jesus die for my sins? And do I exclude anybody? Is there anybody on the list who isn't part of all? Who is all? Who does all encompass? We laugh because we actually make a list. We do as human beings. It is so easy for us to say, well, you know, they're the could you witness to a Satan worshiper? Have they crossed the line of no longer all? I mean, who is all? So that's a very interesting conversation to have from all this information that we are going to get going through here on this <laughs> belabored podcast. <laughs> But looking at, I mean, this is the point. We still struggle with this today about drawing boundaries where you are not clean enough. And I say you're so full of sin I can't talk to you. Or I say, seriously, they had this compromise. There wasn't, <laughs> the only thing in this list of four that is sin is sexual, sexual immorality. Scripture is very defined about honoring our sexuality and our, our bodies and taking care of our bodies and not giving them away to this and that and doing that with them, that we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. So treat yourself, your fine self that way. So that's another conversation in a different podcast. But here we have those other three things. And so the church is having a party when they hear this list. This isn't hard. So would we have a party? And what would be listed on the list of today? I mean, how would we view this? And then it's like, boys and girls, we don't have to feel challenged about something that's strange and unusual, we do this stuff all the time. When you love someone, you choose to limit yourself. If you've ever loved children, you limit yourself. There's certain things you can and cannot do when you're with children or can and cannot do to help them grow. You cho choose to make your world different so there's room for them. If you're married, you, ch you bet you limit yourself in order for that person to feel love. You want to say love in their language, so you're going to change and limit yourself so you can do that. And then there was one more. Ah, if you are a person living in sobriety, or if you're a person who has someone in your, your, your world who lives sober, would you actually fellowship with them and bring whatever their drug of choice? And, and would you bring that into fellowship with them? Would you have it in your backpack as you enter their house? Would you imbibe of it in front of them? Absolutely not, because if you did that, they would not be your friend, nor would you love them. I mean, who would be insane enough to do that? You, you just don't do that. If you are, and that's your sober, you love your sober friends and your, your, your own sobriety, but no, absolutely no. You can put any kind of defining word in front of no that you want to. Uh-uh, no. There is no way this is going to happen. I'm going to limit myself because I love you. This is what the burgeoning church did. This was the edict that came out of the Jerusalem Council, and they're reading it, and they are having a happy dance party. That's all it's going to take? I love you. I can do this. The Holy Spirit used all of this stuff. He used the Samaritan Pentecost. Peter got his feet wet. Lo and behold, he had no idea what was going to come. And then the Gentile Pentecost. Huh, and then the attacks of the, 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 what they called the Judaizers at the time. And, uh, and do I really believe it? He falters. And it's like, no, Paul reminds me, I can't. 
Cornelius, I can't walk away from this. Cornelius, Cornelius, Cornelius. And they go and they have this conference and they create this edict that takes and unifies the church. Peter admits he was wrong. He repents of the sin he committed. Paul reigns his fine self in and says, yes, these are agreeable things. This is going to work. This is going to work. I know what it's like to be a Jew among Jews. I've lived it. But I can live it without making you live it because it doesn't mean this is how you get to love Jesus. There's only one way. There's only one way to become a Christian, and that is to believe in Jesus Christ. You can't add all this other crap attached to it. We are a Christian because we love Jesus. The only reason we are not a Christian is we have not yet believed. So it boils down to that very simple quote-unquote formula. So how do we handle differences. How do we handle disagreements in church? I don't know if we're going to top this one because this was a really big disagreement, but they did. They walked through a difference that had turned into a disagreement, a big arguing disagreement that wasn't ever going to stop until they decided to meet and come up with a list of four things that was honoring to both sides of this argument. It isn't, it isn't listed as the book after Revelation. What they decided was just something that worked at that time for that church, that this is how we can get along. So it is an excellent microcosm, if you will, of how we should handle differences within the church before they become this arguing disagreement. There was no unrepented sin involved. Peter repented for what he did. He was wrong in siding with the Judah. That was sinful because God had already exp- <laughs> explained it. You can't call common what I say isn't. You can't do that. Um, there was respect, mutual respect. Nothing was hidden. Nothing was done behind the scenes. There's this underlying respect of we're going to argue, but we're going to argue face-to-face. Exactly. We're going to argue face-to-face. And then self-limiting. Yep, I am going to adjust and be in agreement out of love. You're not going to force me to do anything that I don't agree to, and I'm not going to force you to do anything that you do, don't agree to. And there's no sin in this. There's no sin involved in this at all. We are going to come up with this compromise of limitation because we love one another. How in the world did Peter ever know that he would come to this point, this encounter with the Samaritans, this encounter with Cornelius, that it was going to boil down and create this process, not just for the church to survive at that time, but for us to replicate and follow so we can still be relevant today and not get ourselves stuck up and messed up in all these little eddies that we enjoy because they make our humanity feel powerful. But they have absolutely no spiritual effect. They're not spiritual at all. I mean, you just look at some of the past history in our political system here in the United States. And I truly believe every Christian needs to vote. Every Christian needs to understand who they are and what nation ever they live in and to understand what that means and to stand up for morality in wherever you find yourself. You can't just check out and say, I'm not going to be involved in the humanity of my country where I live. That's ridiculous. We are called to love others in Jesus' name, so get busy, go love them. And if I can make a vote and if I can change laws that I think are, are, are not, that are, that are sinful, and I can just state it here, I, we, we love having abortion being legal. And my, it, it changes how I vote and it changes how I think because a baby isn't a problem. Right. So the only way I'm going to make my voice heard is by voting for a baby as a gift. Let's, if we took all the money that we channel in one direction and we created an opportunity for, I've said it on other podcasts, we're getting down a different little eddy here, but this idea, if we use that money to help that woman have that child and help that child, and that woman could earn some of the money we pay to abortion clinics, and because, hey, if, if it's not wrong to kill a baby in utero, there's nothing wrong with giving a woman money if she wants to, to give her and have her baby adopted. There's nothing wrong with it, in my opinion. They are simil- I mean, not even similar because there's no death involved with helping that baby be born. But why couldn't we do something like that, help that process? And right, I, I love that we have choices and we can argue this ad nauseum. We need to be involved in the political process because we are the voice of, of Scripture in there. We need to be involved. But this idea that God wants it the way we want it? Well, well, no. God wants his word to be honored because this is how healthy communities live. He doesn't want his word to be honored because he has an ego. It's like, no, I designed you. You don't do well when you do that. Actually, you end up here and you end up with that. And abortion isn't just an easy thing. It ends up with lifetime things that happen in your body and also in yours. 
Yeah, so there's all, I don't want you to carry that. There's another way to handle this. I want you to understand. So there's this, that is what he's after. And we are the conduit of bringing that into our society. So being connected to our society, that's a great thing. And I'm not even sure how I got down that road, Pastor Robin. So, yeah, you can tell. My brain is now bouncing around. We could go for another hour, but, oh, would that be a horrendously long podcast. So here we have the Holy Spirit coming and having this, this change. And Peter going through the Samaritan Pentecost, the, Gen- uh, the Gentile Pentecost, and then walking through to this result, that the church is going to focus on these things. They're going to focus on walking in differences, but by embracing them, they are not going to live in disagreement. So I'm going to come back to a word that you used earlier as we wrap up. What kind of stereotypes do you embrace that have no scriptural value, but they actually get in the way of loving God and loving others? Thanks so much for joining us on this week's discussion on Who Is This Man Called Peter? Week 5. Please join us and the whole Wednesday night crew at Maranatha's Forest Lake Campus at 6.30 on Wednesday evenings and come enjoy the live discussion with us. Don't forget, you can check out our website, realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday night for all of Pastor Orlean's notes and references, and please feel free to share them with your friends. And today, wherever you find yourself, let's love God and love people. See you for the next Chew on This episode.